So outages happen and in such tense situation, the main priority is to get the system back up and running. But is that it? Is everything done once the service is up? So today, let's spend some time talking about the aftermath of an outage. There are many things to take care of once the outage is mitigated and in this video, we dissect a GitHub incident, understand what happened and look at a set of common practices that we follow to ensure a complete closure. But before we move forward, I'd like to talk to you about a course on system design that I've been running for over a year now. The course is a cohort based course, which means I won't be rambling a solution and it will not be a monologue. Instead, a small focus group of 50-60 engineers every cohort will be brainstorming systems and designing it together. This way, we build a solid system and learn from each other's experiences. The course to date is enrolled by 600 plus engineers spanning 9 cohorts and 10 countries. Engineers from companies like Google, Microsoft, GitHub, Slack, Facebook, Tesla, Yelp, Flipkart, Dream11 and many 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 more have taken this course and have some wonderful things to say. The coolest part about the course is the depth we go into and the breadth we cover. We cover topics ranging from real-time text communication for Slack to designing our own toy load balancer to Greek Buzz's live text commentary to doing impressions counting at scale for any advertisement business. In all, we would cover roughly 28 questions and the detailed curriculum uh, split week by week can be found on the course page which is linked in the description down below. So if you are looking to learn system design from the first principles, you will love this course. I have two offerings for you. The first one is the live cohort based course which you see on the left side and the second one is the recorded course which you can see on the right side. The live cohort based course happens every two months and it will go on for eight weeks while the recorded course contains the recordings from one of the past cohorts as is. If you are in a hurry and want to binge learn system design, I would highly recommend you going for the recorded one. Otherwise, the live cohort is where you can participate and discuss things live with me and the entire cohort and amplify your learnings. The decision is totally up to you. The course details, prerequisites, testimonials can be found on the course page arpitbhairi.me slash masterclass and I would highly recommend you to check that out. I put the link of uh, the course in the description down below. So if you are interested to learn system design, go for it. Check out the link in the description down below and I hope to see you in my next cohort. Thanks. So like always, we start with the incident report and here it goes. The incident was caused when a foreign key for scope tokens exceeded max in 32. This is one very common reason that we seen with GitHub where your auto increment integer column uh, overflowed. Right. So it started not accepting rights and it led to a lot of failures and a perpetual downtime. Right. So this resulted in a high failure rate for GitHub actions and GitHub pages. What's common between GitHub actions and GitHub pages and why? Like we have seen so many outages happening with GitHub actions. Why so? If you see with integer overflow where your auto increment integer column uh, hit its limit, it typically happens when you have very high write rates, right? Because that's what you would exhaust the limit. And actions and pages are very high throughput service. It has very high write rates because GitHub Actions is triggered every single time you make a commit, linting is run, you make a push, your entire CI CD flow is run. So there are so many actions that are being taken, so many tasks being executed. So that is, it is very likely of a candidate of where your integer limit would breach. By default, 32 bit integer, signed integer is 2 billion, while unsigned integer is 4 billion, and that's not much for a write heavy system. Right. And another set of actions where you might find it amusing ki, hey, my integer ID would cross is push and pull. And which is exactly what we also see in the outage document. It is also, it also prevented some access to operations against GitHub APIs and low level Git commands like push and pull that used scope tokens. Right. So push and pull, uh, in order to authenticate the request on GitHub, it required scope tokens and push and pull very frequent operation. Again, scope tokens exhausted and done, right? Caused an outage. So very common, very common reason for write heavy systems and which is what we should keep in mind. So if you are using a SQL database with auto integer increment, uh, with auto, uh, sorry, with auto increment integer column, ensure that you are well within the limits and not hitting the, uh, and, and not basically having an outage because of that. So, but how do we mitigate? Now say we know that we would be hitting that limit very soon. So what's the strategy? The mitigation strategy is very simple. Run a schema migration that would convert a 62-bit column to a 64, uh, to convert a 32-bit column to a 64-bit column. 
but this is very time consuming because there will be far too many rows but in general you have to do it you have to do it there is no way out and which is exactly what github also did they mitigated this with a long running schema migration to change the foreign key to int 64 and this is a very common thing here when you see because it was a foreign key reference right this is typically put under the carpet like people typically skip it ki Are, it's just foreign key foreign key integer and it's that so people take care of ids as such the primary key of the table but foreign key typically is very sneaky right so people might skim it through people might forget about it and this is what the reason for this outage was so the scope token integer uh, auto incrementing integer column foreign key reference which led to integer overflow 32 bit so Inti the id column was there it was 64 bit but the foreign key was 32 bit that was the problem right so the id column is very well within the limit it's 64 but the foreign key at 32 so when id overflowed when it went from when it crossed that 32 bit limit foreign key started failing which is what caused this outage so what was the mitigation strategy run a schema migration change the column type of foreign key column uh, to 64 bit and that's exactly what they did but this takes a very long time because uh, the number of rows would be very large schema migration would take a long time to complete but that's the only way out you can't do much so convert integer to big integer and run that schema migration to handle that right and that's exactly what even github did and everything was fine but now comes the interesting part and, and obviously just to uh, uh, if you'd want to know how this happens uh, how to do this actually do this migration and what all challenges come in i've i've basically covered it in two different videos which i would highly recommend you to check out uh, and it's all under github dissection uh, uh, github outage dissection you'll find the exact ways to run this schema migration why it takes long time how to do it quicker uh, three or four approaches i discussed so you can uh, watch that video to understand how this actual mitigation happens but uh, coming to the main agenda for this video like Assume that the mitigation is done, everything is up and running, but is that it, right? Do we have to do anything else on, uh, apart from this? So that's what it's specified in this report. Once the foreign key migration was successful, obviously the rights started or the rights started to get accepted and things became normal. The internal engineering teams then worked to slowly remove token records stored in our cache layer that were considered invalid. This brings us to a very important point issue was mitigated right what is issue mitigation mitigation is all about you phase in outage once the system is up and running your issue is mitigated but it is not yet resolved so mitigation and resolution are two very different things right mitigation just implies that hey my service was not running but now it is running done that's mitigation right but what after mitigation so first thing that i would want to discuss is data inconsistencies so what happens is let's say we fire two SQL queries one after another, right? Let's say we are doing a bank transfer where I'm uh, adding money into one's account and I'm subtracting money from one's account, right? So A equal to A plus 100, B equal to B minus 100. Now let's say between these two statements, so update A equal to A plus 100 happened, then before B equal to B minus 100 could have happened, the system crashed. So this put my data in an inconsistent state and this is very important. So one way to handle this is by using proper guardrails like uh, SQL transactions to ensure that either all of them happens or none of them happens, basically atomicity of the operation. That's one way to do it. But in other case, there might be, like this is very well possible when you're doing it within a database. But if your queries or if your operations are cross database where you're updating in one database and also in another database, it's hard to maintain consistency, like strong consistency between the systems. So that is where what you should be ensuring is when the outage happened, check for such data inconsistencies, understand the system really well, check for data inconsistencies and ensure that those things are cleared off, right? This is what GitHub also did by removing, uh, by removing like kind of not really an inconsistent, but some invalid tokens were there in the cache, which they removed, right? Because they were not really needed anymore. And that kind of puts it in inconsistency, but in general, Whenever you are having an outage, after that, ensure that your data does not go in an inconsistent state because it might be an irrecoverable situation. That should not happen. Right? Second point, which is very relevant to this outage, is cache invalidation. So 
Some of the data in the cache might need to be deleted because partial entries were not fruitful, right? So what happens here is you wrote to a cache, then you had to remove it, but, be, but between that outage happened. The entry is still there in the cache, which it should not be, right? So maybe what uh, we need to do is this is a very common use case where your cache has a lot of stray entries, which it should not have, which is where it is important to understand how you are utilizing your cache and do cache invalidation if required, right? Because you should not be serving very stale data to your user. That's where it's a very important thing that after an outage, understand how your cache behaves and see if you'd want to invalidate the critical reads that go to the cache, right? And if you are okay serving it, let it be, but if not, check for those inconsistencies and invalidate the cache if you want to. Right? And at least notify the dependent services key something like this happened. So you might want to clear off the cache that you have. Okay, next, alerting and linting are already in place to prevent integer overflows in the database. This is a very important point. What GitHub says is they already had alerting and linting in place to prevent integer overflows in the database. They already had it but then still the outage happened. Why? Unfortunately, these mechanisms were not sufficient in this case due to it being a foreign key that predated our linting. Right. This is pretty interesting because they had the guardrails, they had all the checks, they had linting in place, but still it, but still it happened because these mechanisms were not sufficient because it was a foreign key that changed. Like I said that ID column checks, everyone puts it, but foreign key is such a thing. It's very sneaky. And that's exactly what happened with GitHub. So they had checks on the primary key, but not on the foreign key and which led to this outage. So what they do is they, in response, we are manually auditing all int 32 columns, not just primary key, but all int 32 columns and investigating further improvements to our automation to help prevent search outages and moving forward, something, something, something. Okay, this is very important. So what we learn from this is uh, alerting, very important, linting, very important. They had those things in place, but still it happened. So having such ways to ensure like regular audits, regular audits of things are very important. So what we should all be doing is auditing the alerting strategy to ensure the right set of alerts are configured. So here it was a miss. The alerts was configured on the primary key, but not on the foreign key. So ensuring that we periodically audit our alerting strategy and ensure that everything's in check and we would be notified whenever something similar might happen. And this is not just we do it beforehand, but if an outage happened, Right. Once the issue is mitigated, set up very thorough alerting. What we should be doing is once an outage happened for a reason A, another outage should not happen with the same reason. That is how you should be operating. That once you made a mistake, you learn from it and you ensure that you are not uh, facing an outage with the same mistake again. Right. So this is what the GitHub team did to, and they set up alerts across foreign keys. They did manual auditing of every single integer column, not just primary key, but every single integer column, just to ensure that they are well placed and they not face the issue with the same reason again ever. Right. What next? Given the nature of this overflow, something, something, but this is important. Our internal engineering teams are actively working on reducing the impact and likelihood of this class of issue happening in the future. Again, preventive measures. This works uh, or this work includes tooling to prevent database inconsistencies and improved alerting to allow faster remediation, right? So this is a very big learning that whenever there is an outage, what you should be doing is you should be ensuring that you are not getting the outage for the same reason. So try to be or take preventive measures, take preventive measures from this happening ever again. So preventing measures to ensure that another outage does not happen for the same reason. It depends. It's very specific to the use case. In this use case, what GitHub did is they re-audited their alerts. They checked for their linters. They ran their automation uh, or they updated their automation to find it. And this is very important. 
this if you just take care of this one thing that you are always ensuring that you would never see an outage for the exact same reason again you are doing a very decent job like because unknown out or outage because of unknown reasons are very common but once you know that it happened because of this reason try not to have it again yeah so this is what we learned from this outage and this is very exhaust and obviously very use case specific uh, very company specific organization specific uh, on what needs to be done but these four checks data inconsistency cache invalidation or so many things have break because of cache not being invalidated then uh, uh, setting up the right set of alerting right immediately like immediately after the outage and taking preventive measures preventing measures to ensure that the outage doesn't happen because of the same reason again is very important doing this would solve 80% of your problem right and you can very well save 80% of your outage uh, outages by doing this basic four steps it's very simple to do but really basic but it does a very decent job so that's it that's it that's it for this one if you guys like this video give this video a thumbs up if you guys like the channel give this channel a sub i post three in depth engineering videos every week and i'll see you in the next one thanks a ton